Welcome to What the Health, an independent approach to your health span. Have you noticed how our healthcare system may not have your best interest in mind? Join Dr. Eckel in this fun and sometimes disturbing exploration of the state of healthcare and what it means for you. Now, here's your host, Dr. Eckel. Welcome back, everybody. Dr. Greg Eckel and Dr. Jonathan Nadal. And this is What the Health in our new format. And we are coming at you from all over the globe at this point, uh, out of Oregon and Utah today. And I wanted to continue our discussion. We're gonna gonna recap the Blue Zones because we we finished on that note last week. And for folks that didn't listen to that, just after this show, go back and listen to it because we are rolling with a whole theme of longevity, your health span, uh, and quality of life. It isn't just quantity. We want an enriched, full-hearted, love-filled, abundant life for us, for you, and for the world. So um, one of the big things in researching longevity and health span, you know, is around community. And this one, I wanted to pull it out of seven different aspects of, um, you know, what when we're studying blue zones and where the highest concentration of centarians live, which are people that live beyond 100 years of age. And loneliness is a great ager. And this is around, you know, quality of questions asked, le- the levers to pull in your health, in your performance, in your longevity. Um, and Dan Butner, we have him to thank for his research on the Blue Zones. Again, he just took a blue pen. That's why they're called the Blue Zones. Um, and there was also this other aspect of it where they really teased out genes because, you know, we hear a lot of people will come into us in the clinic and talk about, well, it's in my genes. It must be just destined. You know, what do you do when somebody says that to you, Dr. Nadal? It just, we know that it's so much more beyond that. And we, we talked about that last time a little bit, like being able to turn off and on your genes. Like it's not, it's not a set program that's, that's, that we're not able to change. We actually are able to change it. And a lot of things that we're going to talk about are going to help that. Yeah. And, you know, there was a the the Danish twins study uh, that showed only about 20 percent of how long you live is determined by your genes. So you can study, you know, pretty much replica genetic data right here in the twins. And, you know, 20 percent of the time is it playing out uh, the same way in each individual. So, you know, there are these components, again, around the seven pillars in the blue zone. So we've got the move naturally, which is the gardening, house cleaning. They, these folks aren't going to the gym. Um, the purpose, as Dr. Nadal mentioned last week around uh, Ikigai, uh, it's a uh, Okinawan uh, saying is around uh, the, the Nicoyans down in Costa Rica call it pure, pura vida. Uh, it's the good life. It's living the good life, knowing your sense of purpose if knowing your sense of purpose is actually worth seven years on your life and really coming from your heart and understanding that, like why you incarnated in this time, in this frequency um, is, is such a big one. Um, Less stress experience. So having times built in routine routines to shred stress Um, that could be happy hour. Now we're not big, we're not promoting lots of alcohol, uh, but in moderation, um, which actually is the sixth pillar of this. Um, But uh, things to pray, to nap, uh, remembering your ancestors just throughout the day. Uh, The 80% rule in Okinawa, which is around um, 2,500 year old Confucian mantra, um, which is reminds them to stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. And that one, you know, after we mentioned that one last week, I really was paying attention to, you know, sometimes I just shovel it in there, doc, and I I just don't stop. And (laughs) and then you're a little uncomfortable after. It's like, well, wait a minute. There's an old mantra on the planet. uh, What is it? It's Harry Harry Hashibu. Uh, And um, 
so having that, uh, that mantra and just remembrance of we don't need, we live in abundance. We don't need to fill our stomachs to the, to the gill every time. Yeah. And with that, it, it reminds you of the previous one, less stress. Like if you're sitting yeah. down or standing up and eating during your lunch break, rushed and stressed. Yeah, you're, if you eat super quick, you're going to fill up a lot more than you, than you would if you're like in tune with what you're eating and tasting every bite and actually sitting with it. So, yeah. And yeah, and having that gratitude and thanks for that, the actual flavors, like slowing down. And I mean, we are eating the sun's energy. Hmm. It is remarkable, really, like how how much abundance is produced on the planet. And then we, do, we just don't even pay attention to it. Like it becomes like, oh, it's here all the time. I don't need to pay attention. But, you know, I ate a raspberry and a blackberry and a blueberry and watermelon over this weekend and just and uh, cacao and just small bits and just savoring every bite and the I mean, those colors, they just pop, the taste just pop. And it is truly heaven when you tune into that frequency, you know, yeah, it yeah. is, uh, it's pretty, quite remarkable. Um, so, okay, the fifth tenet, heavy vegetables, plant-based diet. Now we've heard this, we're hearing this a lot more with global warming, and we're going to cover those components in later episodes of, of What the Health here on our longevity series. Um but it is true, having more roughage, more vegetables, you know, about three quarters of your plate should be a vegetable material, uh, maybe salad, side vegetable, three quarters of the plate about, you know, we want four to six cups, I'm going to err on the type of six cups of vegetables a day. Um, but this is from the research of folks that lived beyond 100 years old, showed they ate predominantly vegetables smaller amounts of protein. So meat, mainly pork, which is interesting. Um, on average, only five times per month, serving size of about three to four ounces, which is like the palm of your hands, right? Um, or the deck, a deck of cards, like that amount. Boy, you know, you think of some steaks that you've had recently, it's like, woo, I am definitely eating a lot more uh, in the protein realm than that. Um, the alcohol is the sixth tenant. I did talk about that um, a little earlier. Teetotalers, those that abstain entirely from alcohol, um, tend to die seven years younger. Now, that doesn't hold true for the Seventh-day Adventists because that was one of the zones of the highest concentration of centenarians. Um, but we overdo, we do overdo alcohol in the North, um, so in North America. And then seven community, which I led out with starting this, um, it really is on our relations. We are herd animals. Um, we grew up in tribes and we need that, especially, you know, after the last two years, we've really experienced what, what separation and loneliness can do. Um, we've seen clinically folks with neurodegeneration are at the very beginnings of Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, really get pushed into those pathologies because they're social. They had a lot less information coming into the system, right? So, all right. So I just wanted to do a little recap there. Um, really, we titled this show, you know, the first tenet of longevity is don't die, mm -hmm. right? And we, um, you know, we mean it. Uh, the longer you hang on right now, in this next 10 years in particular, uh, there are a lot of therapeutics coming on board that can really help reverse the damage of, you know, hard living on the planet and also regenerate our bodies. Um, but we want to talk about the three killers, but there's one thing that underlies all of this. I'm going to pose this to Dr. Nadal, and let's see. Well, we, we know stress and inflammation, right? I mean, if stress is the more emotive, like it, inflammation is kind of the physio physiological equivalent to what's going on. Um, yeah, from cortisol dysregulation, um, you know, just our white blood cells and immune system being dysregulated. There's so much that happens when we're under stress acutely that then if it becomes chronic stress which so much of us experience you know it just throws everything in our body off and whatever the the, the tendency is whether it's our brain heart gut everyone's got a certain 
uh, tendency for something to go off. So stress and inflammation. Yeah. Stress and inflammation. I would say nine out of 10 leading causes of death are due to inflammation. Yeah. Right. And the, I saw a great Ted talk and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the name of this psychiatrist psychologist that came out on stage saying um, it was very dramatic. I, she comes out deadpan and says, I've been killing people for 30 years. And you think, well, why are you saying that on stage? But um, what's up with that? And, and what she was talking about was giving a negative connotation to stress, right? Mm -hmm. um, because in a therapist component or in that therapeutic relationship, our words matter. Our words matter every day, but in particular, in that therapeutic relationship, even more, hundredfold. And there are these concepts, placebo and nocebo. Nocebo is the negative consequences of thoughts versus placebo is the positive consequences of thoughts. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking you're going to get better, you have a better chance of getting better. If you're thinking you're going to get worse, you have a better chance of getting worse. It's amazing how it works that way. But here was a leading uh, therapist saying, you know, my words mattered so much and I didn't realize what I was doing to my patients and that saying this stress is killing you. The stress is leading to inflammation, right? We did lead with that. Um, and so I just want to make sure people realize there's a lot of things that you can do to decrease your stress and or mitigate because not all stress, like stress is an adaptive uh, advantage of why we're still alive on the planet, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. just gone off the hilt on, um, on just, it's just on all the time. And so, you know, those seven, that's why I started with the seven pillars of the blue zones, just as a reminder that these are the things that we found in folks that live a long and healthy life. Um, and then stress this component around, you know, let's talk about the autonomic nervous system here before we get into the top three killers, because, you know, having this physiologic understanding of the autonomic nervous system, the two branches and what those, how those behave in our body. Yeah, good, good point. Because there's, um, you know, whether years ago, if we we're being chased by a bear or a tiger, like fight or flight right now, if you're if there's a cop car behind you, fight or flight, or you have a stressful situation at work, the, the body internally doesn't know the difference, stress, stress, and all the hormones and neurotransmitters are cascading in a similar way. Um, but I think what you're speaking of addresses kind of like the the more cerebral aspect of things versus the more um, let's call it the the more reptilian primitive brain, right? And yeah. the more the more we set up these pathways and these connections between what is an actual stress for tr stressful trigger, how are we dealing with it? The more we reinforce some of those positive um, control mechanisms that we can kind of work through it, the easier it becomes. So, I mean, there's the body and there's the mind. We we shouldn't separate them completely. Um, yeah take it from there. Yeah, totally. So, you know, what happens under that, you know, I like to say the saber tooth cat coming to eat me, Dr. Nadal. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you have got the bears in your analogy, which is, that's a big code. I think I envision the Kodiak bears of Alaska, which will just <laughs> maul you if you're out. I mean, they can go 60 miles an hour. That's stressful, right? You see one of those animals coming at you. Well, yeah. what happens in the body physiologically is we shunt blood out of our gut. That's why there's a lot of digestive issues on the planet right now because of chronic stress and ulcers occur. When you shunt the blood from the gut, it goes to your large muscles, your thighs, uh, your arms, so that you can fight or run away. It also, blood flow goes to the eyes so you can see the predator coming to get you. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're not gonna be digesting your food there. And you're gonna be depleted because you spike cortisol, which then spikes the, you start mobilizing sugar because you need the energy. And you either, you flight, you run, you freeze, like play possum, like maybe it won't see me, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, flight, fright, or freeze. So those are the three components that happen to you mm -hmm. under stress. And, you know, it, now it's like, oh, I don't have enough memory on my computer. That's stressful. My programs are slowed down working, or I just hit the red light going into work or whatever the, the perceived stress. Lay on top of that, this work we've, we've been laying in 
some of Dr. Joe's Dispenza's work into our clinic and into the culture that we're creating at Nature Cures. And, you know, you get into, you know, we have 70,000 thoughts a day and like 86% of those are the same thoughts we had yesterday. And we're expecting the world to be different today. Yeah. Right? How, how really? Yeah. How does that happen? It doesn't, you know, we have these memories in our bodies of, of the thoughts of yesterday and, and then we have all kinds of evidence of, well, this is the way the world is. It's like, no, that's the way the world has been because that's what you keep dreaming of thinking of. And if you're not catching yourself in the moment of the self-criticism or, um, you know, whatever the repetitive thought process is, uh, you know, one, one of the techniques I, I'd like to share is just, you know, dangerous neighborhood to go into by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you get into a loop or you start getting, you know, that judgmental voice and, you know, maybe I'm the only one that has that voice. I don't know. But when that voice starts, you have to, you put your hand on your throat and you just say out loud, actually, like you mean it, stop, 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 because that isn't helpful. It's not going to change your outcome. It's not going to change the way the day goes for you versus that's just a quick little interrupt technique. Do you have any interrupt techniques that you are coaching people on these days, Dr. Nadal? Yeah, I like the stop. And um, I, actually even that one just applied a little bit more further coming from more CBT kind of stuff. It's the using it as an acronym. So stop, actually stopping, uh, taking a step back, observing, and then proceeding mindfully. Mm. If you want to kind of expand into it further, like one thing is the, the quick physical stop. And then if you actually adopt that and use it as a quick mnemonic to actually be present, take a few breaths in the moment, it can all kind of connect. I, it, that helps me and it's helped a lot of my patients, um, again, from some really good therapists and kind of CBT work, but really easy. To cognitive drive. behavioral therapy for, yeah. for those that are, you know, taking notes out there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So let's get into it because that, that component, there's the mindset, which we, we did cover. And, um, and we're gonna weave that into each of these episodes because it is so important when you realize like, I can't create a different outcome for me if I don't start thinking differently. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately what I want to promote on the planet is people thinking fully with their frontal lobe their prefrontal cortex where the creativity is that allows us to then feel safe and drop into our heart and then actually act, ask and listen to your heart of what, how you should proceed and what you are creating on the planet. You know, because this leads right into the number one killer in North America and really around the globe, cardiovascular disease. It's heart disease, right? Yeah. We have preponderance of heart attacks on Monday morning. There's no uh, surprise there. Like people are not liking their lives, right? We've it's got some stats, um, stats on this. Um, and this is cardiovascular disease and I'm adding in heart disease and stroke. You know, the, these are cdc.gov numbers that I'm gonna be tossing out here. Uh, we've got 696,962 deaths a year in, in North America, really in the United States for the CDC taking these stats for in the United States. Um, and then you can add strokes in there, which is, you know, the leading cause of disability. 2,000 yeah. strokes a day. Yeah, that's crazy. And there's three different outcomes of those strokes. Yeah, I mean, they could hopefully slow or fast recovery, but there could be permanent paralysis, even death, you know, and, and some of the, the paralysis aspects, I mean, it could be just a loss of function uh, from verbal communication, you know, physical movement. It could lead to a lot of sad, hard changes, you know. Dr. Nadal, will you carry this real quick? Because I'm going to be right back here. <laughs> Keep sure. going. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so just to keep going forward with it, um, so we know in general, cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke is one consideration, but then hypertension, right? Hypertension just tending to increase with age, right? I mean, we know that, that the standard kind of textbook has been 120 over 80, right? Um, and that's kind of gone back and forth over the last few years. Um, now some would consider even that to be almost a pre-hypertensive state. 
we know over two thirds of adults have, over the age of 65, will have some form of hypertension, controlled or not. Um, so ideally we want to bring it to that. Hey, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we want to bring it to, to that 115 to 120 over 80. Okay. And it's, as far as what those are, we know the top number. So systolic versus diastolic, like how well the heart is distributing the blood versus how well the heart is filling back up with the blood. So it's just interesting to think about how much stress versus you know positivity and negativity we're letting into and out of the world and kind of mirroring that energetically with what our heart's doing at bringing things in and out um you know maybe a little abstract but but it's i don't think there's a coincidence that that the number one killer is cardiovascular diseases in this country now i would agree i mean you know we look in in chinese medicine which is the heart is the emperor the empress and everything comes from the heart like i, I think it's safe to say most of us on the planet would like more love and affinity, uh, right? To be seen, to be heard, mm -hmm. uh, to be understood. Um, you know, these are natural human tendencies. And you look at the energetics of the heart. And what what I love of is in our tradition in Chinese medicine is we we honor the emperor, or the empress, and all of these symptoms. You know, they're not thought about. They're just so mechanistic right now in the Western understanding or approach to health, which mm -hmm. is why, you know, it's like half the population in North America is on a statin medication, and it has not changed the outcome of cardiovascular disease being the number one killer, right? We've, we've controlled statin for the, uh, you know, cholesterol for the most part, but it's not really addressing the underlying imbalance here. Right. And, you know, I really, I wanted to talk about the numbers because a lot of times folks will, you know, either have the home blood pressure cuff or, you know, they'll go to the, you know, the, at the Walmart or the pharmacy and get the blood pressure checked. But then the attendant just says, oh, okay, your blood pressure is good. But do you know what the numbers were? Like, what were they? Because, you know, 120 over 139, so that systolic number, and forgive me if you already said this one, but 50% increase of coronary heart disease a 71% increased risk of stroke, 71%, which is, you know, there sometimes I will tell you, sometimes my blood pressure is at 130. And I, I know this stat, it's like, who that's an increased risk of stroke right there. You know, if systolic is less than 120, so, you know, 120 over 80 is kind of considered the average. Well, now in the last couple of years, we call that pre hypertension. Yeah. Because because it, it's going to accelerate because that's what's happening. It's not normal. It's very common uh, in our populations and why heart disease is number one killer. Um, but if it's less, if you get your blood pressure below 120, um, and there are ways, and we're going to share how you do that, 38% um, decrease of heart failure, 43% decrease of cardiovascular death, 27% lower mortality overall. So with your blood pressure lower. So again, when you look physiologically, that's systolic. It's from your heart pumping out against your system. Well, what causes your blood pressure to rise? Go back to, to what, 20, 30 minutes ago? A lot of stress and inflammation, right? Right. When we're stressed, like you were saying, you know, all, all this blood will kind of go to, to the distal extremities, lead to some constriction just to maintain that pressure and that ability to fight or flight. So, I mean, and but obviously there's a lot of other aspects like nutrition and, and how much you're moving, moving, but stress is huge. In a stress is huge. And, um, you know, so when veins get cholesterol buildup, they get smaller and smaller. So you're putting fluid through a pipe. It's like, you know, if you're out in the garden and you're using your hose, you put your thumb over the big hole that it gets much harder, right? The, the stream of water becomes much harder. Well, that's what happens in the body too, folks. And that's how your blood pressure rises. And then that's putting undue stress on your eyes, on your kidneys. And, and that's really in your hearing, you know, all of these things, that's the issue with hypertension is the end organ damage. So we're going to stress here, you know, how do you measure and assess? So it is, you know, definitely get your cholesterol checked, get your inflammatory markers checked. We look at particle size in our clinic. 
Um, so you want to you want to differentiate because it is a little bit. Well, I would say it's very antiquated just looking at cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol plus inflammation. We like uh, highly specific C reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. Those two cholesterol plus inflammation equals uh, cardiovascular event. Um, there's a great test that we've come across, which is VO2 max testing. It's the best testing for um, any microvascular changes, even 10 years before it becomes a macrovascular event, meaning with you could pick it up on imaging. So you can pick up changes to your heart and your cardiovascular system 10, 20 years prior to any issues happening. And it's totally reversible there. You know, you've got to make sure your, chole your cholesterol is under control, LDL below 70, uh, no diabetes. You're not even pre-diabetic. So that would be hemoglobin A1C. You want below 5.8. We would recommend below 5.5. Uh, so those markers, plus then your cardiovascular output, um, you know, exercising 20 minutes a day in a moderate heart rate is really the key. Like you can actually age backwards. Now, if you're couch potato or you haven't been moving your body, start with a couple minutes, just walking, um, but move it or lose it. It is in Chinese medicine. Again, the blood is the healing aspects of the body, you know, your circulation matters. And if you're not moving your body, you're not getting the circulation. And so that's not, that's not going to be beneficial for you. And, you know, again, not sexy. This is not sexy medicine. It's not like some purple pill or some new device I can sell you, but it is just going for a walk in nature, get out there and smell the roses. I mean, it's springtime right now, all over the planet, or at least in the Northern hemisphere. And it is beautiful. The lilacs just went off. Uh, the roses are coming out in the Rose City there. Mm -hmm. um, one other test that I wanted to share, and then we'll move on to the second killer, um, is a CIMT. It's carotid intimal, uh, intima thickness uh, testing. So it's an ultrasound of the veins that you can really measure the plaque sizes. Now, that's a macro vasculature event. And I'm telling you, we can pick this up in micro land. So for 30 year olds, 40 year olds, like it's not too early. This is not, you know, heart disease is not an old person's disease anymore. This is going younger and younger and younger uh, because we're becoming less fit. Yeah, it starts way earlier. And, and even with those VO2 max studies, like there's impressive ways to catch it early. So yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Don't wait, don't wait till it becomes a macro visible problem for sure. And honestly, you know, it's what 25% of the time, the first symptom of heart disease kills you. So a quarter of the time, I mean, this is where, you know, I'm in my fifties. This is where you hear of your friends that are 50 years old. They just die. It's like, well, what, what happened? And they're like, well, his heart stopped or he had cardiovascular disease. His first symptom had no other symptoms before then. Um, and so it is, it is a life or death component and that we're talking, don't die here. So this is the first one, get, get the ticker checked, right? Yeah. Get the ticker checked. Yeah. Get the ticker checked. All right. Number two. Yeah. Cancer. It's the big C word. Big C word. You know, it, it's hard. It's like how, how many of you know somebody, friend or family member it, it's for everyone. I feel like it's barely one or two degrees of separation. You know, somebody, you know, in the last few months got diagnosed with cancer, right? It's just a thing. Uh, ideally, hopefully in time, we can, it can no longer be a thing, right? Yeah. So, I mean, overall stats, where, where are we? 2021, a million, 21, yeah. a million, 898,160 new cancer cases. That's a huge number. And 608,570 cancer deaths are projected to have occurred in the United States. So, I mean, at, what is it? After increasing for most of the 20th century, the, the overall death rates fallen from its peak in 91, but either way, I mean, it, it's an issue that we need to deal with head on. And the, the, they're gonna fluctuate decade to decade, but if the overall trend is increasing, then we know it's an issue, right? Well, we actually are showing a decline of 31% from 91 through 2018. Good. So, and, and this is really around the campaigns around smoking. So to stop mm -hmm. smoking, that is one of the largest 
levers for longevity and your quality of life. Um, you know, we, I, you know, the saying is we're not going to eat, we're not going to supplement our way out of a potato chip bag, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're doing, you know, smoking cigarettes, they're very um, carcinogenic because of the way that they're produced right now. Uh, but also, it's a very hot and drying substance coming into the body. So in the Chinese medicine perspective, it dries your blood. As we age our blood, we become blood deficient, meaning the quality or information in our blood isn't what it should be, right? And we just talked about it in heart disease where circulation matters, movement 20 minutes a day, getting up into a moderate level of your heart rate, it will really change your life. It will change your world. Um, and there's nothing to buy there. Like it's just movement. So this, we are showing a, a, a trend down because non the smoking campaigns and then early detection and treatments. Mm -hmm. um, so that's 3.2 million fewer cancer deaths than would have occurred in that time frame from 91 to 2018. Right. Um, but we still have a long way to go. I mean, this is the number two killer. It's about 98,000 less deaths a year than cardiovascular, but that's still a lot of death. Uh, it's a lot of death. And that's a lot of new cases that you said in 2021, almost 1.9 million people diagnosed. That's where it's like one degree of Kevin Bacon here. Like we are, you know, we all know people that have had cancer or have died of cancer. Um, and so these, uh, you know, the four leading cancers, there's four that are the biggies, right? Um, halted prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. Yeah. So those are the top four. Um, you know, it, it's kind of the dreaded C word, right? I mean, nobody wants to hear that. They're thinking, ah, oh, chemo, radiation, you know, surgery, what am I going to do? But, it, you know, our new understanding of cancer is we're, we're treating it like a metabolic syndrome, right? It's it's kind of, we can treat it like diabetes now. Once you have cancer, you know, the stats are skewed a bit here when we're talking about survival rates and, um, you know, which cancer would be a better cancer to get. Um, you know, some of them are highly treatable conventionally and others like pancreatic cancer, or there's a lot of glioblastomas and brain cancers that we're hearing about these days or they're deadly. I mean, we haven't found a, a way to slow them down and or stop them. Um, now that said, if you're just doing conventional care, those stats apply. But if you're stepping outside of that box and actually looking at your possibilities, um, that you don't become a statistic anymore. And I think, you know, our moniker is where East meets West naturally. It's a continuum of care. Um, and for certain cancers, conventional is the way to go the whole way. Other cancers, like, boy, that doesn't really buy you anything, but it just talks as your body out and it might kill you, right? Yeah. Uh, and so it is going to a specialist, no, understanding what your options are. Um, you know, we did talk about the top four. So that's breast cancer, it's lung cancer, prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, um, I don't think we necessarily need to get into the stats on those. People are familiar with them, but let's talk about testing and prediction and prevention of these. Yeah, I mean, besides the, the idea of, of some having a genetic component, really lifestyle and just early screening, you know, yeah. it's granted, if there is some family history, there's some getting tested earlier is a good idea, but there's a lot of new advancements. I mean, was it just a couple weeks ago we were even meeting with someone on, on this new screening tool, which is super exciting? Yes, we yes. 10 years ahead of any markers that, that would easily be determined. So there's, there's a lot coming out there. There is. So again, first tenant, don't die. Um, I got to meet with a company out of India called SAR Labs. Um, Ashish, um, I forget his last name, but he and his brother, uh, they created this company. Their father was an amazing, brilliant researcher a medical doctor, but died of cancer. And so these brothers were determined to find a solution. And um, I think that they have. Now it's not available in the United States yet, um, but we are, uh, we're kind of front of the line because we've been in communication with these folks. Um, and it's very promising where it can actually pick up uh, cancer six months before they, they take off running. So it can show particular changes in your blood 
It can even type, if you have cancer, it will tell you what stage it is and what the predominant tissue type was, like what was the origination of that cancer. This in the past, as of like yesterday, we would have to like go in and biopsy and then send that into the pathology lab. So it's a, it's a surgical procedure and looking at typing the cancer type could, to then dial in a specific therapeutic. So this is really, it's revolutionary. Um, you know, we, we've got the grail blood test that we brought in. It's, it, it will test for 60 plus different types of cancers. Um, you know, some issues around that one is it's not super specific or sensitive. So, you know, depending on what kind of information, I know there's a lot in, uh, you know, Tony Robbins and Peter Diamandis are talking about their, um, life force, a book out where they're doing full body MRIs and um, scans along those matter to pick up. But even those scanning for a palpable mass is, is kind of almost too late, right? I like this idea of being able to do a blood test to detect early because then, you know, then you can really utilize even bioenergetics of what's happening in your field before it physically manifests in matter. Um, and so there are, there's a lot of things there that we can unpack. Um, there's also, uh, we have this prodrome test that, uh, you know, we had a whole episode with Day and Good now on what the health, he wrote the book, uh, Breaking Alzheimer's. Well, he's linked pro, uh, plasmalogens with all neurodegeneration, but on this test are GTAs, gastrointestinal tract acids. Um, and if they, if you're deficient in these GTAs, uh, it shows an increased risk of colorectal cancer and pancreatic cancer, um, and also other inflammatory disorders and diseases. So that's a nice, um, it's a ultra long chain fatty acid. It's made by the gut microbiome. That's again, why we test the microbiome on all of our patients. Um, and then those GTAs are absorbed into the blood supply. So over 90% of colorectal and pancreatic cancer cases are detected in persons with GTA levels below the 25th percentile. So there are, um, you know, there are some earlier screening. Definitely, you know, the um, societies in um, gastroenterology have reduced the, the age that you start annual screening for colorectal cancer down to 45, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, like Dr. Dahl mentioned, if you have a family member um, that had cancer, whatever type of cancer, whatever age they were diagnosed and or started exhibiting symptoms, that's the recommended time to start screening for yourself. So, I, you know, we have a lot of patients with, um, you know, had uncles or fathers died of prostate cancer in their 40s. And so we've been screening them for the last two decades um, because it's something that you need to pay attention to. Um, a lot of times people, especially around cancer, they want to put the blinders on. I'm like, ah, I don't want to work. Yeah, yeah. That's not a good situation to do that. In. Yeah. The earlier the detection, the more we can do about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number three, near and dear to us. What do you got, Dr. Nadal? Neurodegeneration. Yeah. Good alliteration with the near and dear to us. Yeah. Yes. Neuro Neurodegeneration. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, when we think of, of picture an 80, 90 year old person, okay, maybe they have Alzheimer's, right? I mean, it, it's, it is very common, sadly. What are we talking about? 134,240 people, right? Yeah, with Alzheimer's. So that's just Alzheimer's. Yeah, there's a whole That's about 80% of dementias are Alzheimer's. So there's another 20% that aren't. It's like Lewy body dementia, mm -hmm. other dementias. Yeah. But- you know, 6.2 million Americans living with Alzheimer's, uh, it's not a death sentence, uh, but it can be. Uh, you know, the average uh, age of death after the diagnosis is about four to eight years. You know, some people can live 20 years with this condition. Um, projected, this is on the rise. Um, it's going to surpass 13.8 million people. So we're currently with 6.2 million people living with Alzheimer's in the United States. Mm -hmm doubling by 2060. Um, wow. yeah. And then lives affected, there's 11 million American caregivers providing over 15 billion hours a year. Uh, you know, and that's unpaid care. You know, it is a drain. I, you know, my Nana had dementia 
Um, and so I, I definitely, you know, she had it for 10 years and she could tell stories from the past, but just didn't remember anything and possibly also did uh, repeat herself quite considerably. And it is, um, it's, impact, it's impacting, right? When you lose your brain, um, the individual is gone. Yeah, it affects the whole family. Yeah, yeah it affects the whole family. It's very, um, it just impacts. Like it's a lot of work to care for these folks. Um, and they, they're not the same person, right? Because their brain, they don't have that prefrontal cortex anymore. Their brain is disintegrating, actually. That's what, you know, uh, Dr. Alzheimer in 1906 described it as a very peculiar disease. And on dissection, he noticed that the brain was rotting, basically degenerating um, in the skull. So th there's differentiation that I want to get into, and it's not just a depressing topic, it's a real topic. So it, it is, um, you know, it's getting younger and younger. People are um, exhibiting signs of dementia and early onset Alzheimer's. 2017, Blue Cross Blue Shield, their actuarial data of all conditions in their database, the average age of onset. So we're saying, you know, we're saying like 65 and older predominantly. The average age of onset 2017 in Blue Cross Blue Shield was 47 years old. That's wild. Yeah. That is wild. And so what can cause that? Like, what, what is contributing into this? Well, we know now it's, it's much more than just aging, right? I mean, it's so even some of the things that we check for, like environmental toxicity from metals, plastics. I mean, the, the state of the world right now, there's, there's a lot of that. But then from ancestral trauma, trauma in general, stress, which we've talked about, basically anything that's that's impacting blood and chi in our body is affecting that in our brain too. I mean, the whole talk on like type three, you know, just the idea of relating diabetes to, to some presentations of Alzheimer's where, yeah, it's changing the microvasculature. And, and we know that there's a lot of damage done when there's dysregulated sugar in the blood and everything that's associated with. So um, is it a surprise that it's happening earlier? No, but does that mean that it's, it's clear that we should be able to do something about it if it's more to do than just aging? Yeah, so it's a call to arms for sure. Yeah, and you know, one, one word on that too is because I think what happens now, especially with folks over 65 is when they get this diagnosis, it's like, okay, all the providers just throw the tower and like, well, okay, you're gone, next. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, that should not be a happening because we are seeing clinically, we are seeing this reverse. We have also Dr. Dale Bredesen to thank uh, for educating a whole group of physicians around the Bredesen protocol, which I actually call naturopathic medicine 101 because it's diet and lifestyle recommendations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's been able to show and publish this data on the reversal of Alzheimer's. Uh, we've had a stage two um, which is a pretty advanced form of Alzheimer's. There's three stages of it. So this is a middle stage before it really becomes into a terminal component. Uh, couldn't do one plus one, uh, got multiplication factors back, got his sense of smell back. These are things that shouldn't turn around in the medical literature that we are actually seeing in the clinic. Um, and so I don't want to provide false hope, but I also want to provide some hope in that we're going to leave the door open for people. And there is a lot to be done here. So if you are witnessing your parents or grandparents going through this um, for them, but also for you, like, let's get you assessed. And, you know, what what kind of tests are there? What are we looking at here with neurodegeneration? Yeah. So, I mean, we can dive right into genetic testing, you know, from yeah. checking out APOE4. We know about 25% of people will carry at least one copy of the APOE4. Two to three percent will carry two copies. It's one of the strongest risk factor genes for Alzheimer's disease, so it's it's huge to consider. I mean, although inheriting it does not mean that you'll definitely develop it, because genetics, like we talked about, it's only going to express some of of what could be expressed from your ancestors about twenty five percent of the time, like we mentioned yeah. earlier. Yeah, uh, epigenetic plays a huge role here, but it's still worth knowing about. You know, if, if that's what's going on in your body, let's make sure that we can do everything we can to prevent it from expressing that. 
right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you have a, a big asterisk over here when we start talking genes. So, right, not contradictory. We look at genetic profiles. You know, we do a very, we can do it very in depth uh, work that has a whole database of research to show what works with different SNPs, which are single nucleopeptides, SNPs, um, that we will put in because it's kind of like taking yourself to the front of the line. Like, um, instead of, going on the time tested what has worked for the most amount of people. This is um, really taking you to the front of the line with your genetic platform, but it's a big asterisk. So we, I like to mention that though, because it'd be highly motivating to start making changes if you have that SNP, right? Yeah. So we, we need to look. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned uh, diabetes and blood sugar regulation before. Yeah, we know insulin sensitivity plays such a huge role at, at neural inflammation as well that it just can't be ignored anymore. Yeah, it's not, it's not just a disease that's affecting the body. It's definitely affecting the brain and, and how it's trying to recover and heal from, from anything. So avoiding blood sugar spikes is going to be essential to, to reducing the tendency of insulin sensitivity, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that I've been really, I've been playing around with personally is wearing a continuous glucose monitor. And I, you know, I wanted to, you know, if you would have told me 10 years ago, you're going to wear a device that's going to measure your blood sugar. I'd be like, hell no, I don't want to wear a device to do that. But because of the information we know about blood sugars and regulating glucose in our bodies in a longevity play, and just really in a health information of like, how is this food affecting me? How are my decisions day to day? And I'm not saying to wear this forever, you know, two weeks, a month, maybe you're going to do it uh, a month quarterly, just to touch base and check in. It is something I, I really think is worth exploring for yourself. And, um, and to get a read, I see we see folks with type two diabetes, and they've had it for 30 years. And they still don't understand how food affects their sugars in their body. And then they're, they're regulating with insulin, but insulin is not a benign substance. It can also cause damage long-term. So, you know, it is, there are some, again, first tenant, don't die. There are some interesting technologies coming on. Not that we want big brother watching us or monitoring all of these things and getting social credits. But I think there are ways of using this technology for our benefit, um, not total reliance on them, but just to inform us, it's another data point, right? Um, we're putting together, we have a whole program coming into the clinic called Heads Up Health that will pull data from labs and the wearables and all of these devices that we have and actually have a forward facing dashboard for you, the consumer, and for us, the provider, um, so that we can really make informed decisions because really what gets measured gets changed. And, uh, and that's a big piece. I just wanted to put a plug in there because it is something that I'm, I'm actually sharing this with Dr. Nadal now, moving this up into our, our therapeutic regimen of like really implementing these uh, monitors earlier in, in our patient's care. Yeah, right from the beginning. And it'll be, it'll be more, uh, there'll be more quality to it if they start tracking it from early on, because we'll start implementing changes right out the gate. So the yeah. more you can see how, how significant and drastic the changes are happening with the work, it's, it's even more useful and inspiring, right? Yep. Yeah. Our third piece of this is environmental toxicity. And, you know, maybe you've seen ads if you've got uh, the Parkinson's diagnosis with pesticides. Um, we see heavy metals causing a lot of issues with our brains. Um, of course, uh, head traumas, micro traumas to the brain, concussions, injuries, um, you know, impact injuries, because, you know, our brain, our brainstem spinal cord is just floating in cerebral spinal fluid in the middle of our frame, our structure. So it gets bonk. If your body hits something hard, your brain is bouncing around in that cavity up there. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, we look at the microbiome, the gut brain axis, and there are different ways of measuring how full your cup is, but it's really stepping out of the box, taking a full person, full picture look. Um, we did share, uh, you know, the reversal of these conditions, which is great. Um, and then, um, you know, looking at, uh, there's an also another measurement that we run is called the um, 
the WAVI testing, which is an EEG of the brain and it's looking at um, evoked potentials, P300 of response times, how, how quickly your body responds to stimulus. And that can pick up any neurodegeneration really early in the curve and really help us implement a treatment plan that will get you know maximum potential percentage of response for your body. So again, just stressing here in the in the in the ending of the show, you know, don't die. Number one, number two, take some notes from these blue zones and incorporate that into your day to day. Number three, move your body twenty minutes a day. Now, I I really, I mean, I've been remiss actually, Doctor Nadal, because I've really been focusing in on. Um, putting some steel muscle, like lifting weights, and toning the muscle for bone health. But the cardiovascular component really far outweighs the weightlifting, um, you know, moving the body. And it's, a you know, people don't want to hear that, right? They don't want to hear, oh, you have to go exercise for 20 minutes. So let's call it movement, right? Yeah. Dance, put some good music on and dance, you know, um, play. Yeah. play, play. I mean, there it is. Let's play more. Yeah. Um, any last parting components that you'd like to share? No, just, you know, um, building it all the way up to the end. And then don't, don't be afraid of looking outside of the, like, test. Like, get out there and figure out, are there any concerns? Then, then let's figure it out. Let's deal with it, you know? We can live well, play, and, and, and look at all these different lifestyle kind of hacks, and that's awesome, and it should be done. But there's also a component of, of just investigating and testing and figuring out what's actually going on. And you know, just to keep it in mind, and, and there's a lot that can be done in that way, right? Yeah, just encouragement to get into action. If you don't know where to go, give us a ring. We offer complimentary consults. You can just, uh, we'll get that link out there to you, but you can also go onto our website. We have it right there on the first page. That's naturecuresclinic.com. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you all for listening in. This is a, I'm having fun with this discussion. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, support at naturecuresclinic.com. That's support at naturecuresclinic.com. If you have any questions about this show or the previous one or topics that you want to hear about going forward, um, we're on a roll. We put to, I think we've put together some really fun material and we're learning lots. I hope that you are too. If you are, please share the show with your friends and family. So think of two people right now. Just say, hey, I heard this great podcast with Dr. Nadal and Dr. Eckel. I want to share this with you because I want to age well with you, right? Let's take our community with us, right? With our brains, with our brawn, and with community, we will go forward into that lovely, lovely evening. Yeah. So um, again, what the health? We are here on the Contact Talk Radio Tuesdays from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific time. Tune in next week. We'll see you then. See you then. Bye-bye. Okay, you're clear. Awesome. Still recording up there. Yeah, sorry. Oh, wait a second. There we go.